worship. It's a spiritual discipline that every Christian ought to engage in. And while it's true that every born-again believer has been called to become a worshiper of God, well, it's also true that many American Christians are completely confused about what it means to be a worshiper. One reason for this confusion is based on the fact that so many of us here in the Western church have embraced the belief that the word worship simply refers to the songs that we sing before the Bible study. What's even worse is that many believers are failing to worship God because they're guilty of worshiping the worshiper. That's right. Many Christians today are guilty of worshiping the worshiper. In order to explain what I'm saying, it'll help you to know that the so-called worship culture in which we live is producing consumer Christians who are constantly looking for the so-called worship experience, which really is nothing more than something that makes them feel all warm and fuzzy. And so going to church early and being there on time for the worship experience, it's not about bringing honor and glory to God. It's about how I feel when I worship. Oh, I love this song. It makes me feel so good. This is worshiping the worshiper. These believers have become more concerned about how the music at church makes them feel than they are with whether or not God is pleased with our songs of praise. And with that being the case, it's crucial for every Christian to take some time to ask, am I truly a worshiper of God? Or in other words, we ought to ask this, what does it mean to worship the Lord. Here in our study today, we're going to spend our time answering this question. And as we make our way through our text, we're going to examine three traits of true worship. And so if you're taking notes, it'll help you to know that first of all, the traits of true worship begins with a submission of self. Secondly, this morning, we'll consider how the traits of true worship becomes a proclamation of praise. Thirdly and finally today, we'll learn that the traits of true worship is based on a recognition of rule. And with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter four, where we find the apostle. He's continuing to describe the throne room of God. And as you make your way to Revelation chapter four, I want to continue setting the stage for our text today by reminding you about the individuals that John has already described as he has given us details about the throne room of God. In our study two weeks ago, we were introduced to the 24 elders who were wearing white robes and crowns of gold upon their heads. And not only that, but in our study last week, we find John, he's also introducing his audience to the six-winged seraphim who are always standing before the throne of God. And with this image of the throne of God and the 24 elders and and the four six-winged seraphim, I want you to now look with me here at Revelation chapter 4. We'll begin reading at verse 9 because here John writes, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Here in the final verses of this chapter, we find the apostle John, he's describing the way in which those four living creatures stand there in the presence of God's glory, and they give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated upon the throne. And in order to identify the one that they're singing to, well, we should take a moment to examine the lyrics of the song that they are singing there in the throne room of God. And with this as our focus, I want to back up and look at our text from last week. If you would, let's look there at the end of verse 8. There we find the four living creatures declaring, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, 
As we consider the lyrics of this heavenly worship song, I want to remind you that those six-winged seraphim were actually referring to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when they sang the praises of the one who is to come. When they sing about the one who was and is and is to come, they're singing about the second coming of Jesus. Therefore, it only stands to reason that the one who is seated upon the throne of God is none other than our Savior Jesus, who was sacrificed for the sins of the world. In order to prove my point, I want to take a moment to jump forward one chapter in Revelation chapter 5. If you would look with me there at Revelation 5. I want to focus on verse 6 where John declared, I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now here in this verse we find John, he's describing this lamb who stands in the midst of the throne and We're going to spend more time examining this text in our study next week. I'm looking forward to that. But for now, I simply want to remind you that the Lord Jesus is the Lamb of God. As a matter of fact, in John's gospel account, we find John the Apostle telling us about the way that John the Baptist referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God. John the Baptist referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God who was sent to take away the sins of the world. Therefore, the Lamb who is standing in the midst of the throne is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. With that being the case, the six-winged seraphim were worshiping the Lord Jesus by giving glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever. Now, that word glory found there in verse 9 It speaks of the worshipful praises which exalt the one who's being glorified. And so these seraphim are worshiping Jesus with praises which are designed to exalt his name. Furthermore, the word honor there in this verse refers to the reverence we feel for those who we believe to be highly esteemed. And so these six-winged seraphim are looking at the Lord Jesus, the lamb who's slain, and they're giving him honor. They're they're recognizing that the Lord Jesus is highly esteemed. And then the word thanks here in this verse speaks of the gratitude, which leads us to express our appreciation for another. And and so they're they're giving gratitude. They're, They're expressing their gratitude for the Lord Jesus Christ. And from their example, we can see then that true worship is based on a desire to glorify God as we honor him with thanksgiving. And while it's true that the four living creatures constantly give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne... Well, it's also true that John saw the 24 elders who are seated on their own thrones around the throne of God. They bow down before the feet of the one who is seated upon the throne. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at Revelation 4, verse 10. Here John tells us that the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever. Now, we shouldn't imagine that these guys are all like Dick Van Dyke tripping over their own ottoman. That's not the scene here. They're not falling down because they're clumsy. No, they're falling down as an act of worship. We find the 24 elders who represent, again, the royal priesthood of heaven. These guys represent every believer. And they're bowing down before the lamb who is there in the midst of the throne. And in order to understand this act of worship, it'll help you to know that the word worship, which is found there in verse 10... It's translated from a Greek word which was used when referring to the way in which a Persian person would demonstrate their complete submission to a superior by falling upon their knees and then touching their forehead to the ground. This is the way a person in Persia would demonstrate their submissiveness to a superior. They would fall to their knees and touch their head to the ground And this concept is the basis for the Greek word, which is translated into our English word, worship. 
The word worship also refers to any expression of respect, which is designed to reveal a heart of submissive subordination. Based on this, we can see then that the true worshiper, well, the true worshiper is a person who submits themselves to the one they're worshiping. The true worshiper submits themselves to the one who is being worshiped. And not only will the 24 elders demonstrate this true trait of worship by bowing down before the Lord, but they also demonstrate the selfless heart of a true worshiper by casting their crowns at the pierced feet of our Christ. With this in mind, look with me again there at verse 10. There, John tells us that the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, so they're prostrating themselves in this act of worship. And it tells us that they worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. Now, here in this verse, we find these elders, they're worshiping the Lord Jesus by laying their golden crowns at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in order to put this into perspective, we must remember that these golden crowns are the heavenly rewards which believers will receive for the time that we spent serving the Lord during our time here on earth. In other words, the born-again believer who worships the Lord by submitting our lives to his perfect plan here in this world will eventually be rewarded for the ways in which we set aside our own agenda in order to serve our Savior during the time we spent here on earth. And I believe that we too, much like these elders, we're going to continue to worship the Lord forever and ever through selfless submission by taking those crowns of heavenly reward and casting them at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that this is, the, this is one way that we're all going to continue to worship our Savior forever and ever. Now, in order to grasp this act of worship, I should take a moment to point out that the golden crowns of heavenly reward, I'm going to guess that this is going to be our most prized possession in heaven. I'm I'm guessing that when we get to heaven, one of our most valuable possessions is going to be the golden crowns of our heavenly reward. And what this means then is that the 24 elders, they were taking their most valuable treasure and they were just casting it at the feet of the Lord Jesus. They were placing their golden crowns at the feet of the Lord Jesus. And I recognize that there are some shoe freaks who, who you know, value shoes more than anything else, but most of us you know, recognize that shoes are just kind of dirty because they're on our feet. And lids are what's, what's the best, right? You know, the, the hat, whatever we would put on our head, that's what we would value more. You know, like, like the other day when I, I walked in, I saw Jeremy wearing this uh, silver tiara, you know. I, I was like, what? Is, what's going on here? But now imagine a crown, a golden crown. And how valuable that is. And, and they're taking it off of their heads and placing it at the feet of the Lord Jesus. Now that's an act of worship. And in light of their example, we can see how the true worshipers of the Lord, well, they're the believers who are quick to use their treasure, their most valuable possessions for the glory of God. This reminds me of the way in which a woman named Mary Worship the Lord Jesus by taking an alabaster flask, a very costly, fragrant oil, and she used it to anoint the head of our Savior. This expensive oil, she could have sold it, and she could have used the money to fund her life for an entire year. She could have used it in any number of ways, and yet she just broke open the bottle and poured it out entirely on the head of our Lord and Savior in order to anoint him. There were those who looked on and they insisted that this was a waste of her most valuable treasure, and yet the Lord Jesus commended her for the way in which she used her wealth, her most valuable treasure, for the glory of her Savior. From her example, we can see then how the true worshipers of the Lord are looking for every opportunity to take our own worldly wealth and use it for the glory of God. At the same time, the true worshiper of God is also ready to suffer poverty for the glory of God. 
And in order to elaborate on what I'm saying, hold your place there in the book of Revelation and turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. It's in Matthew chapter 4 where we find the fallen angel known as the devil or Satan. And he's trying to tempt the Lord Jesus to fall into sin. He, he's trying to tempt Jesus into sinning against the will of God the Father. And we should notice the way in which the devil used the wealth of this world in order to lead the Lord into fault, uh, faulty worship. The devil is attempting to lead the Lord Jesus into worshiping him. But this is our focus. Look with me there at Matthew chapter 4. I want to begin reading at verse 8 because here Matthew tells us that the devil took Jesus up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God. And him only you shall serve. Now here in these verses we find the devil, he's tempting the Lord Jesus with the wealth of this world. And he's saying, I'll give you everything. I'll give you the title deed of the world. If you'll just simply worship me. And all he had to do was bow down and worship Satan as if Satan were God. Thankfully for us, the Lord Jesus rejected the temporary riches of this wicked world. And as he did, he simultaneously demonstrated the true trait of worship by submitting himself to the perfect will of God the Father. In this act of worship, he's showing that the true worshiper is the person who submits themselves to God. And in similar fashion, I believe that we too should become those believers who are worshiping the Lord by submitting ourselves to the perfect will of God. And you know what? Sometimes what that, that means is that we're going to miss out on making some money. What that means is that there's going to be times where we've got to tell our boss, sorry, I, I can't come to church on Sundays. Sorry, I can't work those overtime hours. Because that's when I go to church. That's when I go and corporately worship God with my church family. Now the desires of our flesh will always lead us to place the pursuit of worldly wealth before the worship of the Lord. And so that we see it more, it's more valuable to, to acquire the wealth than it is to spend time submitting ourselves to our Savior. But the true worshiper of God is ready to submit everything, including our wealth, to the perfect will of the Lord. We're ready to take the golden crowns that we've acquired here in this world, if you will. And we're ready to take it and just cast it at the feet of Jesus for his glory and use it for his worship. And with that, I would encourage every Christian to worship the Lord by submitting our lives to the service of our Savior. And so we see then that the traits of true worship begins with a submission of self to the, to the will of our Savior. And secondly, I want to point out that the traits of true worship, well, it becomes a proclamation of praise. And with this is our focus, let's turn back to Revelation chapter 4, where we find the 24 elders. They're now proclaiming the praises of him who's seated upon the throne. And if you would look with me again, we'll begin again at verse 9. Here John declares... Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever ever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Now here in these verses we see that the traits of true worship not only involve a submission of self, but the example set by those 24 elders also help us to see that the traits of true worship also includes the proclamation of praise, which the worshiper is, is happy to make with their mouth. As a, as a matter of fact, I should point out that the Greek word that's translated saying, it's found there at the end of verse 10, 
That Greek word literally refers to the act of putting words together with the goal of describing something with a verbal proclamation. With that being the case, we should take some time to examine their worshipful proclamation, their proclamation of praise in the way that they described the Lord. Notice with me again there at the beginning of verse 11 where we find the 24 elders. They're proclaiming the praises of the one who is worthy. Notice that word worthy. That word worthy was translated from a Greek word which was used in reference to a weight that was used in the scales in order to reveal the worth or the value of something. That word worthy well, it's, it's a word that in the English, understand that the word worship comes from the word worthship. Our English word worship is based on the Old English worthship, which finds its root in the word worth, which is where we get this concept of worthiness. That word worth, it speaks of that which has substance of equal value. And based on this, we can see that the elders here are proclaiming the praises of God by confessing the infinite value of the one who alone is worthy to be worshipped. It's for this reason that they declared, you are worthy. You are worthy, O Lord to receive glory and honor and power. Now, the words glory and honor here, are they're both translated from the same Greek words that John used back in verse 9 when he described the way in which those four living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne. And so the four living creatures are giving glory and honor to God and the elders are giving glory and honor to God. And since they're the ones, the, the elders are saying, you're, you're worthy to receive this glory and honor, then what they're saying is, hey, these six-winged seraphim that are giving you glory and honor, God, you're actually worthy to receive that. They're confessing that God is worthy to receive the praises of those six-winged seraphim. From this, we too should always remember that the God of the Bible is the one who alone is worthy of our worship. And, and you know, I see people all the time singing the praises of other people. You know, and, and, it, and it's just kind of like, are they worthy of that worship? Are they worthy of that praise? I would encourage every Christian to follow in the footsteps of the 24 elders by proclaiming the praises of God as we give Him all the glory and all the honor and all the power. Now, in order to understand what this should look like in our own lives, if you would hold your place here in the book of Revelation and turn with me to the 29th Psalm. And and, and the reason why is because it's in in Psalms 29 where we find King David. He's directing the children of Israel to proclaim the praises of God. And as you make your way there to the 29th Psalm, I want to take a moment to point out that we live in a society that is filled with people who are quick to sing the praises of those who excel in some sort of entertainment industry, whether it be movie stars or musicians or sports icons. And it's sad to say that there are many living in the limelight who are also happy to sing their own praises along with the fans who sing their praises. So we've got this culture where people praise other people and then some of those people who are being praised say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to sing my praises as, you know, when you sing my praises too. Well, let's, let's all sing my praises about me. Thankfully, there are still some famous people who are believers who know how to point that glory where it belongs. They know how to deflect that glory to the one who alone is worthy of the praise. For example, I want to consider the the reaction of quarterback Kurt Warner. It was after leading the St. Louis Rams into Super Bowl victory. Immediately after the Rams won that victory, an interviewer came up and, and, and declared, Kurt, first things first, tell me about the final touchdown pass to Isaac. Kurt then responded, well, first things first, I've got to thank my Lord and Savior above 
above all. Thank you, Jesus, is what he said. I love that. The interviewer is saying, first things first, let's talk about football. And Kurt says, no, first things first, let's talk about Jesus. Some people took this as an offense. And Kurt later explained that he meant no offense or disrespect to the reporter. And he said this, he said, I just wanted to use the opportunity to point out that the Lord does come first in my life. And I'm not shy about sharing that with the world. I'm a man who is driven by faith and any power or peace I feel on the football field or otherwise is because of my faith and my relationship with Jesus. Now, this is a football star who knows how to proclaim the praises of God. He knows that the glory doesn't belong to him but rather it belongs to God. He knows that the honor doesn't belong to him, but it belongs to the Lord Jesus. And in my opinion, he perfectly exemplified what King David was saying here in the 29th Psalm. And with this is our focus. Look with me there at Psalm 29. I want to begin reading at verse one here. David declares, give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Now here in these verses we find King David, he's encouraging every Israelite to worship the one who alone is worthy to be praised. And one way that we do this is by verbally acknowledging the fact that God is actually the source of all good things. Our strength well, it comes from God. Our intelligence, it's a gift from God. And it's the foolish person who fails to recognize that God is the one who has endowed us with all of the abilities that we have. Therefore, all glory should go to God. All honor and all power belongs to him. Furthermore, I should remind you of something that Paul said to the unbelievers who were there in Athens, Greece. It's in Acts chapter 17 if you want to read it for homework, but I want to just remind you of what he said in verse 25. There Paul informed the Athenians that the God of Israel is the one who gives to all life, breath, and all things. He's helping these Athenians, these idolaters who worshiped every God except the God of the Bible, He's helping them to understand that God is the one who gives us life and breath and all things. The prophets Isaiah and Daniel both reveal the same truth by assuring us that God is the one who gives us every single breath. Now you probably know this, and so I'm just pointing out the obvious. We need breath in order to do anything. No breath, no life. We need our breath in order to do anything. I was mountain biking recently with Brenda and we were in Waco and it's a very hilly area and it's hard to get to the top of some of those hills and you need a lot of breath. You need the oxygen in, in, in your muscles to, to continue going. And there was a lot of allergens and I was having a hard time breathing and I've got a mask on to keep the allergens out. And so it was just hard to get a breath and I could feel my muscles shutting down simply because I just couldn't get enough oxygen. We need breath to do anything. We need breath in order to speak. If you've ever fallen and lost your breath, got the wind knocked out of you, you can't, you can't say anything. You're just... <coughs> There's no breath, so you can't say anything, right? Now think about it. If it's true that God is the one who gives us every breath, then doesn't it stand to reason that we ought to then use our voices to proclaim the praises of the one who gives us the breath that we need to speak? It literally blows my mind that God gives breath to those who curse his name. May that not be true of us. Would it be to God that we would be believers who use every breath to proclaim the praises of the one who gave us every breath? 
without debate, we should give God the glory and the honor and the power that ultimately belongs to him and to him alone. And listen, I'm not suggesting that we manufacture some sort of automated response like a religious robot who has been programmed to, you know, that's not what I'm saying. I I see Christians sometimes do this. It's like someone pays them a compliment and they kick into robot mode. Well, give glory to God because God is, you know, it's like, there's really no heart of praise. They they just know that they're they're supposed to say this now because this is the spiritual thing to say. So they're going to say it. No, the Lord doesn't want religious robots who declare praises simply because the programmer designed us to do this. No, instead, every proclamation of praise that we offer up to God should come from the core of our spirit man. And the reason I say this is based on the fact that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Not because we're supposed to, but because we want to. Because it's a passion within our hearts to proclaim the praises of God. The Lord is looking for his own special people who proclaim his praises, not because we're forced to, not because we're under his thumb, but rather because we recognize that he is the one who has given us the free gift of grace through the cross of Christ. This was precisely the point that Peter was making in the second chapter of his first epistle when he described his audience, a group of believers as being a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Christian, listen. Every born-again believer should have a renewed heart which now desires to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And as a result, we're going to want to give God all the glory, much like Kurt Warner did after Super Bowl 34. I don't think that he stopped and thought, well, what would would the Christians say at this point? And so let me think that, no, I just think it was just a proclamation of praise that just came from his heart. And that ought to be true of us. That the worship of God should just become this proclamation of praise that just flows from our hearts as we see opportunity to give him the glory and the honor and the power. Unfortunately, there are many who profess their faith in Christ and yet they have no passion for proclaiming his praises. And this brings us to our third and final point because listen, the the traits of true worship, it not only begins with a submission of self and the traits of true worship not only becomes a proclamation of praise, but the traits of true worship is based on a recognition of rule. Now, in order to explain what I mean by this, I'd like you to turn with me back to Revelation chapter 4, where we find the 24 elders, they're recognizing the rulership of their creator. And with this as our focus, let's look again there at verse, 20, uh, verse 9. Here John again declares, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And here in these verses, we're reminded of the fact that the elders worship the Lord by casting their crowns before the throne of God. And, and we've already considered the way in which this act of worship is a submission of self. They took their most valuable treasure and submit it to the Lord Jesus. But at the same time, we should also examine the way in which this act of worship was their recognition of the one who rules. The reason I say this is based on the fact that the golden crowns of those elders was evidence of their kingly position. Remember, the Lord Jesus has made us kings and priests of the Most High God. This is something that John has already revealed here in the book of Revelation. The Lord Jesus makes those who trust in him kings and priests of the Most High God. Therefore, these crowns represent the kingly position of those elders. And when the elders cast their crowns at the feet of Jesus, they were recognizing the Lord as being the king of kings. They're saying, okay, yeah, we're, we've received this position as kings here in heaven. We've got these crowns. But in reality, 
we're standing before the king of kings. And so they take the crown off their head and put it at his feet. And not only did they worship God by recognizing the Lord Jesus as being the king of kings, but they also worship God by recognizing his ultimate authority over the entire creation. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 11, where the elders declared, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and power and uh, honor and power for, notice, you created all things. That word created was translated from a Greek word, which was used when referring to the way in which God fabricated everything that's been made. God fabricated everything that's been made. What this means is that the elders who are there in heaven, they're creationists. This is something that gets debated here in this world and different Christians even hold different ideas about God's work in creation, but the elders who are in heaven, they're creationists. And they recognize that God created everything. In other words, uh, they're, they're creationists who believe that the universe and everything in it was fabricated by the divine designer who created everything by his almighty power and all for his glory. And based on this, we can see how the expression of worship, which was offered up by those elders there in heaven, it was based upon their recognition that the Lord is both king, they put their crowns at his feet, and creator, they acknowledged that he created everything that's been created. And not only is the Lord worthy of worship because he is the king and he is the creator, but they also recognize that he is the commander in chief. And with this in mind, look with me again there at verse 11. There the elders worship God by declaring, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and notice by your will they exist and were created. Now the word will It's translated from the Greek word, which refers to the commands of God that reveal his perfect plans and purposes. So verse 11 could be translated, that last sentence could be translated, by your commands, they exist and were created. What this means is that the elders were casting their crowns before the king and the creator because he's the one who has commanded everything to exist. And he's the one who has revealed his perfect will to his creation through his commands. And with that being the case, we can see how the worship of the elders was based upon a recognition that the Lord is the king, the creator, and the commander who sovereignly reigns and rules over his creation. Now, based on their example, I would argue that we won't have a heart that truly worships the Lord until we first recognize the rule of the one who reigns on high. As long as I think I'm the one who's in control, well, then I worship me. As long as I continue to think that I'm in control of my destiny, then my worship is for me. But when I recognize that God is the sovereign ruler of heaven and earth, all of a sudden my worship is for him. We won't worship the Lord through a submission of self unless we first recognize that Jesus is the king of kings. We won't worship the Lord with passionate proclamations of praise unless we first recognize that God is our creator who gives us every single breath. And listen, we won't demonstrate the true traits of worship unless we first recognize the Lord as our commander in chief. In order to further grasp the point that I'm making, if you would turn with me to the 95th Psalm. And as you make your way to Psalm 95, we should all take a moment to examine our own lives. We should take a moment to look within our own hearts because it's important for us to make sure that we're actually becoming believers who demonstrate the traits of true worship. And with this as our goal, we should ask ourselves a very simple question. And the question is this, do we readily recognize God's rule in our lives? Or are we still calling all of our own shots? 
What I mean to ask is this, are we aligning our lives to the authority of the one who is king and creator and commander? Or are we still pulling up our own lives by our own bootstraps thinking that we're in control and that we're living by our own will? these questions in mind, we should consider the way in which King David, the king of Israel, demonstrated the true traits of worship here in this worship song. If you would look with me there at Psalm 95, beginning at verse 6, here King David declares, O come, let us worship and bow down. Here's the king of Israel bowing down before God. He says, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Here in this psalm we find King David helping his audience to see the connection between his own recognition of the Lord's rule in his life and his passion for proclaiming the praises of God. Not only that but the lyrics of this worship song also present us with a picture of a king who worshipfully cast his crown at the feet of the Lord by confessing that he was nothing more than a sheep in the pasture of God. Here's a king, but he's a king that's just saying, hey, I'm nothing more than a sheep in the hands of the good shepherd. He wasn't boasting about his position over Israel. And the reason why is because he immediately recognized that God is the king. God is our maker. God is our ruler. He is our shepherd. And he alone deserves our worship. We find a similar sentiment shared by the psalmist who wrote Psalm 100. And with this is our focus, if you would move forward five chapters. I want to read the 100th Psalm. And so if you would look with me there at Psalm 100. We'll begin reading at verse 1 here. We read, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. He, his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Now here in this song of praise, we find the psalmist acknowledging the authority of the God who has created us for his glory. And as we consider the content of this worship song, we once again see the connection between our view of God and our desire to worship him with worshipful songs of praise. And from this, we can see that it's the Christian who recognizes God's rule in our lives who will then also demonstrate the true traits of worship as we set out to live our lives as an act of worship unto the Lord. Now, as we begin to wrap up our study today, I want to take a moment to remind you that worship, it's so much more than just the music we play before the Bible study. Not only that, but the true worshiper of God is more interested in glorifying God than they are with the warm, fuzzy feelings that so many associate with the so-called worship experience. It's sad to say that there are many Christians who are guilty of drawing near to God with their lips, but the reality is their hearts are far from him. And what this means is that, you know, they don't really see any value in being here for corporate worship. They don't really see the value of singing the songs before the Bible study. Or they come and they sing the songs because they're looking for an experience that blesses them rather then brings glory to God. And, and knowing that, that we can be so off in all of these areas, it's just important to remember that the true worshipers are, of, of God are dedicating their lives to bringing glory and honor and power to the Lord. 
And with that being the case, I want to encourage every Christian in closing to make sure that we're believers who are demonstrating the true traits of worship. And with this as our goal, we must always remember that the true traits of worship begin with a submission of self. True worshipers are, are, are those who are saying, not my will be done, but, but the Lord's will be done in my life. The true traits of worship then becomes a proclamation of praise as we become passionate about proclaiming the praises of the God we worship. But these won't be true in our lives until we recognize God's rule in our lives. We must become those Christians who recognize that God is the king. God is the creator. God is the commander. And it's his will, not mine. Based on this, then, we can see uh, that a believer who is demonstrating the true traits of worship, they're not only excited to show up to church so that we can sing songs of praise, but the true worshiper is also a Christian who has dedicated their entire life to giving God all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the power that belongs to him and to him alone.